And now, Presto Chango! Tracy was waiting quietly at the crossroads just outside town as Caleb arrived. Hello, Luna Moon, Caleb said. Did you come alone? I told my friends that this meeting would be just between me and you. Good, says the brownie replied. At least you understand that how much of your duty this is supposed to go. Doesn't mean we won't listen. As Gale turned to the source of the voice, the mulberry half collided with the side of his face. <clears throat> As he fell, the rest of Tearly appeared in view. Right before us, he wrenched his forehoof around his back at a painful accident angle, pinning him to the ground. Do you want to know what happened to the last stallion that messed with my students? Tearly demanded as he continued to apply pressure. Do you? Tearly. He said the Timberwolf after two of my students. Tearly interjected, A fucking Timberwolf! Duh, let's go! Gale gasped out. Or else the monsters will keep coming! Tearly looked up at Trixie to see if she thought Gale was bluffing. A sick of her head told the teacher and otherwise. Reluctantly, she let go and backed off. Gale let out a groan of frustration as he stood back up. Every man in this town is crazy! Tracy couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. And yet, you still chose to mess with this town. I swear to the moon, if this is your attempt at an ambush... Oh, keep your mane on! Tracy shot back. If this was an ambush, you'd be in chains. And believe me, nothing would make me happier at this point! Tracy closed the distance between her and Caleb. You know, despite all the mistakes he made, I still know that any pony Bantu hurt was unintentional. Do you honestly think that Bantu would be happy about the amount of devastation you have purposely caused in his name? Caleb just rolled his eyes as he placed his hat back on his head. Are you here to agree to this duel or to give me a lecture? Tracy sighed in frustration. All right. If I agree to this duel, you have to stop whatever it is you are doing to the creatures in Everfree Forest right now and leave Ponyville alone. Only if you agree that this duel is between you and me, Gale shot. That means no calling the princess or the gods or no pony stepping in if they don't like the way the duel is turning out. Fine! We will meet here tonight after moonrise. Name your terms. No so fast. Gale pulled out a small bag, poured the contents in his huff. He then blew it on it and rubbed it, rubbed both hoes together, muttering a few quiet words until they developed a pale glow. Let's make this official. He held out his huff. A pact! Tracy asked in dismay. You cannot be serious. Let's just say I am feeling distrustful. Realizing there wasn't a way out of this, Tracy touched Gale's huff. Name your terms. We meet in this spot, right after moonrise, a duel. Gale explained. If I win, I get both of your titles, and you leave Ponyville permanently. And if I win, you don't bring harm to anyone or anything in Ponyville ever again. As the two hosts separated, there's a spark of green light. While Trixie and Gale wobbled slightly, as they both felt dizzy for a moment before recovering. This seemed to satisfy Gileb. I'll see you tonight, Little Moon. Gale turned and started to leave. He promptly sped out his departure when he noticed Charlie was taking a step toward him. At that, the two mares started to head back into town. So what was that about making a pact? It's a little absurd some policies the brownies invented for when they doubt some ponies could keep their agreement. Tracy looked at her hoof to show it has like glow. Don't ask me how it works, but once a pact is made, it literally cannot be broken. Why was some pony has made it so you couldn't keep the pact? There have been horror stories about ponies trying to work around the pact, Trixie replied. I really don't want to risk it. So what do we do now? Charlie asked. You go back and make sure every pony got out of town all right, the representative answered. I need to go prepare for a duel. Anything I could do to help? No, the representative answered as he started to head back into town. I just need some time to clear my head and get ready. I've paid my dues after time. 
I've done my sentence, but committed no crime. And bad mistakes, I've made a few. I've held of my sheriff's and hit in my face, but I have come through! <gasps> Trixie stopped and wait, turned to face William and the rest of the beatniks nearby. Sorry, guys, Trixie replied. I'm just not feeling it. Oh. As the rabbit said, just walked off of Bartholomew to piss his thoughts. Told you we should have gone with Bonnie me and Rhapsody. As Tracy arrived at residency, she saw Pokey set a table on the front lawn, sorting through some paperwork. Hey, boss. Get business with that Zabroni sorted. Yes and no, Tracy replied. So you evacuate with the rest of the town. I figured you want me to stay here and hold the foot until you got back, so I volunteered to hang out and keep watch. Tracy stopped and stared. Pucky, if I ever gave you the impression that I value your ability to be at my beck and call over your own personal safety. Dear bus, Pucky irritated. Someone needed to stay and keep an eye out, so I'd rather it be me than some pony that can't take care of themselves. Tracy got outside of relief. Good to hear. This is merely a precaution. Hopefully every pony will be back in town by tomorrow. What happens tomorrow? I will face scale up in a duel. Now, I need to prepare, so please, take care of any visitors. Sweet. I'll go get you some bourbon and then keep watch. No bourbon, Tracy replied. Just keep watch. As she entered her residency, she paid no heed fact that Pokey was keeping her. No bourbon? She was digging through her supply chest, looking for things she might need to use in her duels. She so brought out her thoughts by the sound of Hoof knocking on the door at wood. She looked up and saw Raydrop standing there. Hey there, the Pegasus said. Uh huh, Tracy stated. Listen, I don't really have time to talk. I need to get ready for this duel. Yeah, heard about the whole pack thing. That sucks. Tracy paused and then slammed the trunk shut in frustration. You know what? It does suck. I tried to be good. I tried to take the moral high ground. I tried to play things about Bullard. Sir, I slip up. Quite often. But at least I try to be decent. And the type of point that others can look up to. So you won't really start pacing. Take this mess with Caleb. I tried to approach this like a representative. I engaged him, but didn't accept his challenge. I made it clear what would happen if he went after me or my friends, but didn't antagonize him too much. And then, when he started playing dirty, I used legal means to get him out of town. Despite all of this, I still ended at the exactly same place I would have if I accepted his challenge. So what have I gained? You mean aside from the knowledge that you're doing this for the sake of keeping Pointfield safe? Is that some ego attempt, attempt to prove you're better than a trash-sucking zebra? Ray Johns asked rhetorically. Zebroni, Tracy corrected. Don't care. At the Sussie's pool, he's lucky that's all I'm calling him. Ray Johns closed the distance. Point is, it sucks that he's using the town as le leverage, but the only pony blaming you for this mess is yourself. How about we discuss that? Despite her mood, Tracy couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. So what? You're sending it to be my consular. Not really qualified to do the gig full time, but there are two messages I understand better than most. The water pony is staying. One is anger, the other is regret. Raindrops pulled up a chair. Now the anger part is a no brainer. From what I hear, the line of ponies wanting to kick his flank is ever growing. So, you want to discuss regrets? Trixie clarified. Because there's a lot about this situation that I'm regretting. Like how things ended with Caleb and his brother? The representative looked like she was about to let a skating remark, but then stopped herself. It was only after she did a mental 10 count that she found herself willing to discuss the matter. I have had a lot of friendships that ended badly, but Bantu was the first time I literally ended the friendship. I still don't know how you could be friends with some pony like Caleb or his brother. They weren't always like this. A young Trixie followed her grandpa as he led her to a new part of New Orleans. Where are we going? A young Philly asked. To see a dear friend of mine. Corman replied. As they walked past what appeared to be a male pony carrying a tray of baked goods on his back. So what got Tr Trixie's attention was the fact that he was a light green with yellow mane and dark green stripes. 
Grandpa, is that a zebra? Yes. What do you mean, answer or chuckle? <laughs> They're cuz the brownies. Be sure to remember that, cause they really don't like being mistaken for zebras. Ah, here they are. The two ponies stopped in front of a store that read, Madazeri's House of Wonders. As the two ponies stepped to the store, Trissy was amazed by all the various items. Her attention was then drawn to something specific. Is that a pony skull? She asked. Ducky! Excuse me. The, voice of a, the source of a voice revealed itself in the form of a purple lavender and magenta zebroni. They are wearing various colored necklaces around her braces. Oh my god! It's a pony version of Gilmore. The pony I traded with claimed it was from Tampanon, but I'm deaf. Cormu and the mayor then embrace each other in a hug. It's so good to see you, Zanine. It's good to see you too! Zelling replied as he disengaged the hug. And let's get the lot! As those continues as always, Quarterman replied, though I did make a slight detour in the small town as the north of the thing I heard a lot about. He pulled a bag and handed it over to Zabrani. Either brought you back a souvenir. Zelling came to contents of the bag and experimental sniff to let out a squeal of delight. A quarter moon! You always bring me the best stuff! Celine didn't notice Trixie. She kneeled down to have a look at the young Fury. Who is this? This is my granddaughter, Trixie. Pleasure to meet you! The Celine took out a hope for Trixie's sake. Trixie cautiously shook it. No, I got a couple of grandsons hiding about somewhere in my shop. You could go try and find them if you like. Trixie checked with her grandfather to see if it was alright. After getting his approval, so he went out to explore the shop. Finally found two cults playing cards in the back. One was light blue with dark blue stripes, an aquarine mane that looked to be Trixie's ace. The other was honey brown with a T-male and brown and brown stripes that looked older was wearing a purple scarf. And that is game, Nitzabetha. Come on, Bounty, triple or nothing, the blue coat replied. Sorry, Gatib, but you know the rules. Delta replied, Well, only you now to bet up to three weeks with the chores. The two cults stopped away when he noticed Trixie standing there. Hi, I'm Trixie, the young filly said. Matthew and Caleb looked at each other, then back at Trixie. Oh, uh, hey. What are you playing? Booker. Oh, can I play? Trixie has Grandpa taught me. Matthew raised an eyebrow to Philly. Sir, but you're going to need something to buy in. Tracy frowned. All I got are cookies. She opened her bag to reveal the cookies her aunt had packed for her. Banshee grinned slightly as well. That the do. So wait, you're telling me your first meeting was him scamming your cookies out of you? Not exactly. <clears throat> My grandpa. Corwin's lean turned away from the coffee they were drinking to see Tracy standing there. Wearing a purple scarf as it was a cave. Now I look like a real magician. Before the elder could respond, Bantu came out. All right, not double the nothing, but this time I did. After Salim suggested that the three foals get out of the shop, Gil and Bantu decided to take Trixie to the bazaar. You're going to adopt this, Bantu said. Okay. Trixie paused to look down at the scarf she was still wearing. You can have your scarf back if you like. No, no, it was, you don't understand that scare, Bantu said while I was shaking myself. Besides, Papa looks good on you. Tracy gave Bantu a shy smile as the three headed to the bazaar. There, Tracy was amazed at all the zebronis that were there, as well as just how busy the place was. There were ones selling things at the stalls, playing musical instruments, even ones doing mundane things like sweeping the sidewalks or shopping. And all of them were wearing the clothes of a bewildering array of styles and colors. They almost made the pony scared amongst the crowd look drab by comparison. They stopped by a striking zebroni mare with a red coat, pink stripes, and an orange mare wearing an elaborately filled sundress and carrying a box they were about to block their path. I ain't Monsieur Zurla, Banshee said cheerfully. What have you got there? Just some poor souls that they rescued from the griffin trying to smuggle them out of town. Just when did you make a stand against smugglers? So it's a pretty sure he was planning on eating them. The mayor loaded the box so Bantu and Caleb and Trixie could have a better look. 
There's a need to go to the home if you're interested. A little while later, they returned to the shop. How was the bazaar? Quantum Moon asked. Great! Tracy said excitedly. I saw many things. I got my own fairy spitfiver! Tracy opened up her cell mail to reveal a live snake inside. Quantum Moon's eyes seemed to jump out of his skull while he leaned to slightly. There's a good spitfiver, dear, not spitfiver. Aww! The unfeeling whined. I already called him Mr. Spinny. We stayed friends, even after I moved to Cantalot for my studies, Tracy explained. We sent letters and stuff, but I never did physically see him again until after I left. That was until... There was a loud banging at the door. I'm coming! I'm coming! A teenage Tracy yelled. Did he open the door to find an older Bantu standing? He was fully grown, more developed, and currently out of breath. Well, he's definitely the same Bantu as he remembered. Tracy, you got to help me! Tracy looked inside at her friend and stepped inside to let him in. Quick, get inside! When I found out he was on the run, yeah, I felt betrayed. Yeah, I was disgusted at how he trivialized robbing a relief train for his own gain. But it just changed that in a single moment of clarity, I saw that what my friendship with Bantu would cost me, and I decided it was not worth it. Yes, you decided that being friends with a thief that attacked a relief train was not worth risking everything you had worked for in Canterlot. In the time I've been here in Ponyville, I learned that there are always more than two options. There could have been another way to handle any situation. There was probably some third option I could have taken, but instead I chose the option that protected me. That doesn't make me any different from some of the scumbags we took down. Self-preservation and self sternness are two completely different things, Raindrops countered. Bad to soup was already sinking, and the fact that you weren't keen on yourself on board is understandable, Raindrops countered. Maybe, but whenever I've been in trouble, you and the others have always been willing to step in and help. Yeah, friends do look out for each other, Raindrops agreed. But if I thought you would view a tra train carry relief supplies to get a quick risk scheme, we wouldn't be friends. Deb brought a faint smile to Tracy's lips, from any point else that would have sounded like a threat. For raindrops, it sounded like a compliment. Look, I know nothing I can say is going to change things to do with you, but Bantu or Gilb, or how you feel about it. Only you can change that. The other point put a huff on Tracy's shoulder. All I could do is give you the same advice somebody gave me once. Keep on trying. You're a good pony, and someone others can look up to you. Yes, you color outside the line sometimes. What you do is with the best intentions in mind. You will mess up, and you'll have times when you do everything right, and things will go wrong. But all you can do is keep on trying. Tracy smiled, turned to anyone. Thanks. No problem. So, what's the plan of the attack for this duel? The Pegasus asked. Give him the razzle-dazzle zip-zap. Tracy stared at her friend. Is that honestly what you call my style of magic? Well... I used to call it the old Sparkle Sparkle, but after the running with Twilight, I figured it might not be appropriate. Well, magic wise, illusions and mysteries are what I'm good at. But that's how a lot of voodoo works, so I can't rely on it. Most of my equipment will be no good in a fight, but I can't afford to go in empty hoof. Caleb will no doubt have a few more than a few party favors. Any advice? <laughs> it goes down to close quarters, fight something soft and bite down hard. I recommend the nose and ears, but get creative. By him, Tracy asked. You practice Iron Huff, and your advice is by him. You think you can learn anything more complex by tonight? Point taken. There was a knocking on the door. Poggy went to answer it. Next thing, the other four elements walked in. When Tracy stared, Lyra started to answer. We know that you need to face Gale alone. But we wanted to remind you, we are still here for you, and offer support in whatever way we can. The rabbit's aunt have looked at her five friends, and could only smile in gratitude, as she was reminded how lucky she really was. Thanks. I'll pull you something that could help in the duel. Caratop pulled out a bag and gave it to Trixie. Trixie opened the bag. Rocks! You have a head with one's nose and sits on down, Caratop explained, and he got close enough to swatting the whole bag at him. You're the team herbologist, and your plan is to throw rocks at him. Can't get anything else that could help you fight in the maiden time, the farmer replied. Must, can you honestly expect you to throw a rock at him? 
Tracy paused for a moment, point taken. Charlie stepped forward, holding what looked like a curved piece of metal. This is my lucky horseshoe. Charlie demonstrated by clipping it on her front hoof. Get him in the face with this, and even your punch will leave an impression. Trixie felt a pair of gray hose wrap around her. Nikki and I wanted to give you a hug from luck, Tizzy explained. Thanks. It's so good for me to give you this. The male bear handed over a baseball bat with the words love and tolerance written on it. Just remember to give it back to him when this is over. Trixie finally turned to Lyra and simply shrugged. I just brought candy to keep your spirits up. The musician levitated a paper bag to prove her point. I didn't know we were supposed to be bringing weapons. It was near the end of the day, and Gail was finishing preparation. Various files and trinkets made their way into the numerous pockets of his coat. He even made sure that his hat was looking right. Almost ready. Just need your finishing touch. It was the case to find his mirror when he stumbled across an old picture. It was him and Bantu when they were younger. He stopped to look at it. While it used to be a reminder of happy times, right now it reminded him of what he was fighting for. Come on, Bantu. You cannot be serious. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Batu replied to his brother. Just think of what we could do with the ingredients that train will be carrying. What I can't stop thinking about is you're talking about train rubbing a train, but to be carrying relief supplies, Gail shot back. We'll leave most of it, Batu argued. We'll make sure that they discover the robbery not too far from Catalot. The train gets resupplied in no time, the relief supplies go where they need to, and we both go a big this time. Everyone wins. Except us if this goes wrong, Gail said. Sorry, Batu, but they can't be part of this. Batu threw up his hose in dismay. Fine, then. At that, the oldest giant started to leave. Ready you going, Gail asked. If you want to let opportunity pass you by, that's your choice. Batu sat back. Well, this is my chance to make it big, and I'm taking it with or without you. Shot. Gail could only stand there as he watched his brother walk away. I will make this right, I promise. Packed away the phone and pulled out his mirror. But first, I need to get my game face on. Buggy stepped in as Trixie was finishing gearing up. This time let you know the sun's on the city. The assistant said, when well, he paused, Where are your friends? Old the representative answered. You're coming with me to the duel, but I just want a few minutes of celebrate time before heading out. Do you need anything? No, no. I just wanted to give you this. Buggy held up a hip flask. Just in case you change your mind about that drink before the match. Tracy took the flask and gave a grateful smile as he pocketed it. Thanks. Don't mention it. Just don't lose him, okay? Pucky requested it. I don't really tell my mum I'm taking orders from some crazy bloody now. Tracy laughed at that. I had no intention of losing, she so assured him. So, want to come along and see me in action? Pucky raised an eyebrow. It deprives you the opportunity of countless regaling me with the splendor as your victory over the weeks to come. Oh, there'd be plenty of regaling, Trixie asserted him. Like I could trust something as trivial as your own eyes to truly come again, my splendor. Despite the banter, both of you, of course, were smiling warmly. The pokey gave a nonchalant shrug. I don't have anywhere to be, so why not? The florist and Pinky and Chester, he opened the door for Trixie. So, are you ready? Trixie paused as she took one last look at her hat before placing her head. Well, as Grandpa used to say, let's make some magic!